Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we're The Minimalists. We're here with Malabama. Hi, everybody. C.K. Coleman. What it is. Oh, coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we're talking to a few listeners about food clutter. What foods to subtract, what foods to add for a, the most nutrient-dense diet. And of course, joining us in the studio today to tackle these questions is our good friend, Dr. Paul Saladino. Yeah. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. We also have an outstanding lightning round for him as well. A bunch of different questions where he has a minute to answer each question. You can check those out. Also, a live stream question, some listener tips for you. You can check out the full three-hour maximal edition of episode 384, where we answer about 10 times the questions, and we dive deep into several Simple Living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash The Minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. By the way, I should mention before we start this episode, none of this should be construed as medical advice. Feel free to consult your medical doctor, your astrologist, your puppy, whoever you would like to consult before uh, changing anything in your life. Although, ultimately, I think it's your responsibility to change what you want to change in your own life. Let's start with our callers. If you have a question or comment for our show, give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Sarah. What are four foods one could subtract from their diet to live more healthfully? Now, Paul, I selected this question first for you, mainly because, and I even added the word for, because I listened to your podcast episode, which by the way, Paul's podcast is called Fundamental Health. And um, I listened to your podcast episode and I thought it was perfect for the minimalists because we're always thinking about what food should I add? What are the healthy foods I'm supposed to eat? And we'll talk about that here Mm. in a moment. We have another question about that. But really, Health often involves subtraction. We figured it out with material goods. Mm. Ryan and I aren't against all material goods. TK, when he came on board, he's even convinced us that some material goods are really (laughs) beneficial. Before he came on board, we were like, uh, send us an inventory of everything you own, (laughs) TK. (laughs) But Paul, I want to take an inventory of really the things, the main things that you've subtracted from your own diet and you've seen other people that you've worked with subtract from their diet to live more healthfully. Yeah, thanks for this. This is a great question. It's such a minimalist question. When I was thinking about this, it's like, this is perfect for the show. And I just want to state from the outset that I'm I'm not a fruitarian. So people are just not expecting that to come (laughs) later in the show. (laughs) Just prepare you guys. But I, I think that there, there are two ways that I think about how humans can live healthfully and optimally. And they're generally the things that you add to your diet, which we'll talk about, the most nutrient-rich foods, and then the things that you subtract, the most toxic foods. Mm. And I, there, rather than four foods, I would think of four categories of food or four ingredients that end up in our food supply. And if you look at the way our food supply as humans has changed over the last 100 years or so, these ingredients have become ubiquitous, unfortunately. So mm. eliminating from your, from your, them from your diet will be a true exercise in minimalism because I would say for most people, 80% of your pantry will go away and probably 75 to 80% of the grocery store will be things that you do not choose to eat anymore because you've made more intentional choices. So mm. number one is seed oils, corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, grape seed. These processed, so they're refined, bleached, and deodorized oils from the seeds of plants. And if you look at some of my content on social media, I've reposted YouTube videos about how these oils are made. And basically looking at the process of making these oils will help people understand how bad they may be for them intuitively because these oils come from seeds which must be roasted or ground. Then the oil is very fragile because these seeds naturally don't expect to be ground if we're talking about anthropomorphization of seeds and oils in them. And then the oils must be bleached and deodorized and extracted with hexane because of contaminants. And so you're ending up with a very fragile oil that gets basically put through the ringer and abused and, you Mm. know, jumped in an alley and completely mugged and ends up being a not very healthy food for humans. Mm. And then, you know, the, the marketing of these oils is so confused to consumers because the medical community looks at them from a very myopic perspective. And I don't want to get too technical, but we 
I'm a physician. And so when we look at oils for humans, basically the only metric that we want to understand is do they raise or lower LDL? And that's probably a separate question, maybe for another podcast. These oils may lower LDL, but they also raise other markers of oxidation of LDL, which mm. are probably better predictors of cardio cardiovascular health. But that explains why they've been promoted to us. But getting rid of them will then, I think, improve people's cardiovascular health, the cell membranes, the mitochondria. So seed oils, get rid of them completely. And in favor like in a little preview here, I would, I would actually favor animal fats or fats that are much lower in the polyunsaturated fats, specifically things like linoleic acid. I don't want to get, I'm kind of technical, but linoleic acid is in seed oils. So you want to avoid that in high quantities and other oils. Animal fats are actually much better from that perspective. Second thing would be high fructose corn syrup. Mm. Most people can kind of understand this. I think within the zeitgeist, we've been told that sugar is bad for us, but there is some nuance around high fructose corn syrup being different than other types of sugar. And that I think that's maybe something else we could talk about in the podcast. I actually think that honey, especially raw, organic, local honey can be quite healthy for humans. There's evidence that honey raises testosterone, which is generally a good thing for humans and an indicator of overall health. And even in diabetics, giving people up to 125 or 150 grams of honey per day, people who have underlying diabetes, lowers fasting blood gl glucose. That's a lot of honey. It's a lot of honey for a yeah. diabetic and it lowers fasting blood glucose wow. in an eight-week trial. So again, we're talking about things to exclude high fructose corn syrup if you see that on a label it's it's actually a it's a processed sugar because they extract it from corn it's going to be entirely glucose and in order to get fructose they have to isomerize the glucose they have to change the structure of the glucose molecule lots of problems with high fructose corn syrup the mm. third thing maybe something surprising for a lot of people, it's artificial sweeteners. And these are things like Splenda, Sucralose, Ace-K, Aspartame. But it even in my mind extends to things like um, Stevia and monk fruit. And um, I can talk about why in a moment. But the, the more commonly known sweeteners that are not considered natural, Splenda, Sucralose, Ace-K, Aspartame, these, these have some pretty bad effects. At least in animal models, aspartame has been associated with increased anxiety behaviors, which is actually heritable between generations of lab animals. And that's at doses that are at 15% of the FDA maximum human dose equivalents. So 15% mm. of the human dose equivalent of aspartame that's allowed to be given to us as humans you know, like per day, um, that creates heritable anxiety behaviors in lab animals. Sucralose, Splenda, has actually been studied in humans and when combined with carbohydrates and foods, creates an increased insulin response, increased glucose sort of in response to meals, so glucose intolerance, metabolic dysfunction. So it's creating this neurometabolic confusion in the human body. When you're eating some of these sweeteners and your body's receiving a signal that says, the food is this sweet, and your body, after hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, expects it to have a certain amount of calories, and it doesn't. It creates this sort of neurological confusion, and your body doesn't know what to do in terms of the insulin. So even if we look at stevia and monk fruit, and again, this is probably the whole podcast, these appear to interrupt the way our gut flora communicate. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of back to the um, the preview of the next, the answer or the corollary to this question, which is what would you eat instead? And I would say for most people, just use real foods that humans have been eating for hundreds of thousands of years, and honey as a sweetener is probably way better. Mm -hmm. The last thing is the most controversial thing, and it for me... Um, vegetables do not always serve all humans well. Mm. And yeah. the, what I, the, way I've tried to, the way I've tried to frame this in, in my messaging is, look, if you're thriving, more power to you. Eat a salad, eat some kale, eat some broccoli. But I think that there's a lot of people out there who have some sort of autoimmune issue, some sort of gut issue, whether the gut issue is gas, bloating, constipation, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, or you have some skin issues, psoriasis, eczema, or you have a little bit of a mood issue or a sleep issue or insomnia. They have something going on and they don't find answers. And they might even dig really far. They might go see, quote, alternative physicians, but very few physicians, I think, are going to say to a patient, the spinach you're eating might be causing your problem. Wow. Because it's become such a part of our culture as just a, a universally accepted benign and even more than that, like a, a valuable food, a, you know, a beneficent food for humans. And so if you, spinach is a good example though, because if you look at spinach, it's super high in a compound called oxalates, mm -hmm. which we know accumulate in the human body. We make a small amount of oxalates, maybe 10 milligrams a day from the breakdown of amino acids in the human body. And when you eat even a cup and a half to two cups of spinach, you're going to seven to 10 X that amount of oxalates in your human body because that amount of spinach has 700 milligrams of oxalates and you're going to absorb about 10%. So just eating a salad at one of 
these salad places in LA that you think you're doing the right thing could yes. 7x the amount of oxalates in your body. And these compounds are the main component of the most common type of kidney stone for humans, calcium oxalate mm. kidney stones. They accumulate in the joints. They accumulate in our thyroids. They accumulate in breast tissue. We don't fully understand how they're causing problems for humans, but there's clear case studies of them causing kidney failure when people do like smoothie cleanses and they absorb lots of these oxalates. Mm. So you could make a smoothie out of almonds, turmeric, spinach, uh, and chocolate. And those are four of the highest oxalate containing foods. And people have done that and ended up in honestly like on dialysis. Yeah. I have a friend who has uh, kidney stones recently and like that you're, sounds like you're describing her, her diet to some extent. It's like, it's a traditionally healthy right. diet. Right. Mm. So it's, so the, the vegetables thing is like, the way that I would frame that is think about what plants are trying to do on the earth. Humans, animals, bugs, we exist in, in conjunction with the plant kingdom. And we are, we're trying to live and plants are trying to live. Plants have an intention to, they're alive. They're trying to move their DNA to the next generation. And so plants must put defense chemicals in their leaves, stems, roots, and seeds to allow them to have some sort of a kind of like Heisman strong arm mm -hmm. <clears throat> to keep the animals and insects at bay that want to eat them. And so mm -hmm. for some people, those defense chemicals cause problems. So the four things, seed oils, high fructose corn syrup, artificial sweeteners, vegetables. Mm. Now, I'm shocked that we're not mentioning other things, but I think they fall under some of these categories. You know, the first thing that I would think I would hear is just processed sugar in general, right? And so we, we hear that from virtually any health conscious person is I've removed processed sugar, I've removed bread from my diet. You often hear I've removed dairy as well. I was hoping maybe you could touch uh, a bit on dairy because the, a lot of people do have problems with dairy and removing dairy from their diet can be really helpful, mm. but there are some reasons they might have problems with dairy. Yeah, dairy's fascinating. Um, so there are a lot of cultures on the planet that drink a lot of either cow or goat milk dairy, the Maasai, the Samburu, uh, these African cultures, and they exist with profound health. A lot of the Norwegian cultures are based around dairy. Um, within the Western world, we dairy is a very different thing. There's like different types of dairy and different qualities of dairy that humans can eat. I think the biggest problem that most people have is lactose intolerance. And with that, I think that there are ways to eat dairy where you have less lactose in the dairy if you choose to include dairy in your diet. You have yogurts, you have kefirs. Some people say kefir, but I actually looked this up on Google Translate because I heard the two pronunciations. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure kefir is right. <laughs> um, but I was at, over at Erewhon making a smoothie with them because we're going to do a smoothie collaboration, the first animal-based smoothie at Erewhon. And, and even the guy that I was collaborating with from Erewhon making the smoothie was saying kefir. And I'm sort of smirking to myself thinking, I know how to pronounce this. <laughs> so kefir... It's like gif and jif. Yes. Right, right. right. Yeah. Or Porsche and Porsche. Porsche. Yeah. <laughs> so... So fermented dairy will reduce the amount of lactose and goat's milk dairy has less lactose. Mm -hmm. The second nuance you have with milk is A1 versus A2 when you're talking about cow's milk dairy. And this yeah. refers to the variant of casein. There are a couple of prominent proteins in milk, whey and casein. An A1 casein is a different shape of the casein protein molecule than an A2. Mm -hmm. And it... it when it breaks down and is digested by the human body, it makes different molecules, specifically something called beta casein 7 when you have A1. And that seems to be associated with some problems in some humans. So if mm. you if you are having a problem with dairy, you might do better with an A2 dairy. Jersey cows? Jersey cows are all A2, and or some of the manufacturers will just say A2 on the label. I find my daughter mm. drinks a lot of milk, but raw milk, sits way better with her. Is that an experience you've had? Yes, raw milk is really interesting. And there's there's a bunch of memes right now on the internet about people getting arrested in Canada for selling raw milk, but they can traffic like, I don't know, drugs or something, some other type of contraband. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, one of the nice things about being in LA is it's easy to get raw milk. There's a couple of great farms here that do it. So when I was reintroducing raw milk into my diet, or dairy into my diet in raw cheese and milk over the last maybe year and a half, I did some research and found a series of studies which are really compelling. They're observational studies, which are associations, but the associations are compelling and consistent. And the association we see is that if kids grow up drinking raw milk, and these are kids that grow up on farms or off of farms, they have lower rates of eczema, asthma, and allergies in adulthood. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. And so you could say it's observational, correlation is not causation, but it looks to be a real correlation that's probably connected with raw milk. And some people hypothesize that that's related to um, the 
uh, different bacterial organisms in raw milk. But there's other people I've seen in the research say, no, it's probably related to the whey protein conformation. So now we're looking at the other protein in milk or one of the other proteins in milk. And when you heat the whey protein past maybe 160 degrees, and most pasteurization processes are heating of milk, they go much beyond 160. The conformation of the protein changes. We know this. This is what happens when you cook an egg, right? right. You put it in a pan, the proteins change conformation. The egg goes from clear in the white to firm in the white and actually white. Right. So proteins change in conformation when we heat them. And so something about the whey protein in cow's milk, which is what's been studied, appears to be beneficial, potentially beneficial for humans from an immunologic perspective. And you lose that when you heat the milk. So mm. those are the things I would suggest for people with dairy. But I, 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 I believe dairy is a very powerful tool for people. And like I said, these studies that actually show significant health benefits are compelling. And if you look at the dairy research, even deeper than this stuff, there's a lot of research that including dairy in the diet is beneficial. Kids mm. that have more dairy fat are leaner growing up. So I think for most people, including dairy, uh, either cow or goat, or sheep or camel or something, is is worth considering even into adulthood. Yeah. Let's talk about alternative milks: oat milk, <laughs> rice milk, almond milk. Yeah. Does this have to go, or is this something to include? You know, this is probably something that we could piggyback into the first question. I think it's something to get rid of oh, wow. for a lot of reasons. Yeah, mm. um, many people. You know, it's funny because when I was at Erewhon, I had this smoothie that we're making in a sample and there's a woman waiting for a smoothie at the bar and I said, do you drink cow's milk? And she goes, oh no, she makes this disgusted face. And I'm thinking, I wonder what her story is, you know, why she doesn't do that. Like most of the people at Erewhon are looking for these nut milks. And I think that we've, for some reason, we believe they're healthier. People have lactose intolerance, all the things we talked about. But if you look at the nut milks, I mean, you can take oat milk as an example. Um, most oat milks or I mean, many of the oat milks that I've seen and um, done content about contain seed oils. Mm. So then and you're glyphosates. Like, and glyphosates, yeah. Well, you're gonna get you're gonna get glyphosate because they're sprayed with pesticides and it's gonna accumulate. Mm. But on the label of many prominent oat milks, it says low erucic acid rapeseed oil, which is just uh, kind of a, a, a hidden name for canola oil. It's because canola is from rapeseeds and it's low erucic acid. That's basically canola oil. So they're they're containing seed oils. A lot of them contain carrageenan, which is a um, it, technically, it's a sulfated polysaccharide from algae. And it is a long molecule that is, is shown pretty clearly in animal and human studies to cause inflammation and problems in the human gut. Mm. So a lot of these gums are things that are in food. And that, you know, the, the list of things to exclude from your diet could be longer than four. But, you know, gums are another thing. You have gelan gum, xanthan gum, you have carrageenan. These are thickeners in foods that are meant to be thick, but they aren't particularly thick to start with. Some fake Greek yogurts will use this. Some coffee creamers some will use it. Some people put them in their smoothies too. Yeah, yeah, yeah to thicken things. Yeah. And they, they do appear to be problematic for the human gut. Mm. I don't think humans were eating a ton of, a ton of algae um, historically and evolutionarily. Um, that's a whole separate story. But um, so the carrageenan ends up in these milks. And then you have the actual, cons the, the, the constituents of the milk, almonds or oats or rice or soy, most of which I think are pretty problematic for humans. We have grains, yeah. for instance, and the grains are sprayed with pesticides. Um, the grains contain anti-nutrients. These are essentially the seed babies of plants. And so they're going to have things like phytic acid, which is a large molecule that chelates minerals and actually pulls minerals out of our body bodies. Mm. Um, oxalates can do that too. So almonds high in oxalates. And um, there's an interesting case study. It's only, I think, three kids, but these all three of these kids were improved when they removed almond products and the kids had all genital urinary issues. So urinary tract infection, blood in their urine, pain with urination. And I think a lot of pediatricians see this, like the almond products problematic for adults and humans because mm. of probably the oxalates in the almonds. So, so nuts mm. and seeds in general, obviously. Mm. I mean, when you hear about the healthy diets, one that comes up quite often is the paleo diet. Right. And of course, compared to the standard American diet, many people experience tremendous benefits yeah. from something like that. But they talk about eating plants, animals, nuts, and seeds. And you're saying, well, yes, yeah, some plants, but we all know that intuitively. Like there's a tree in front of this office building. No one goes out and starts chewing on the bark and expects to be nourished by it, right? And so... <laughs> there are some plants, though, and we'll get to that in a, in a moment when we talk about the foods to introduce into a, a healthy diet. Um, but when you look at nuts and seeds, not just the, the, the milks or milk alternatives that you're consuming, but nuts and seeds themselves seem to be problematic. I think they are for a lot of people. And it's, again, one of these foods that's colloquially considered healthy mm -hmm. that very few doctors will tell you 
to consider as a problem for your issues that, I mean, in, just in terms of digestion, I think so many people get better from a digestive standpoint when they get rid of nuts and seeds. Mm. Well, let's just make this clarification. Seeds is a, is a technical term that's correct and grains, nuts, beans, and seeds colloquially are all seeds. They're all things that if you plant them in the ground, they will grow into a plant. That's a seed. And it makes sense intuitively that a plant is going to protect its seed. You can imagine this like, you know, this, this baby Moses, or I forget the actual historical biblical story, being cast down the river Nile completely unprotected. That's what a seed is. It's cast out into the world. And if plants don't put some carapace on there, like a walnut, or they don't put defense chemicals in there, animals are just going to consume them um, ad, ad lib. They'll consume as much as they want. And then mm. all of this chance for these plants to spread their DNA is going to be eliminated. So mm. they do have defense chemicals. They're some of the worst offenders, I think. Mm. Really quickly with defense chemicals, I, I hear what you're saying about plants, but I've also heard people say that about animals, right? Like the, the whole idea of never eat anything that tries to run away from you. Could you say that animals are also releasing some kind of defense chemical to prevent itself from being preyed upon? It's it's different, right? So depending how the animal is slaughtered, right? Um, they may have cortisol, but they don't have defense chemicals in the same way that plants do. Plants put these defense chemicals in their leaves, in their stems, in their seeds all the time. It's not that an animal is full of toxic things in the liver or the muscle meat or the blood all the time. Now, every animal has a life cycle, right? And I think that um, we know that all of us are part of a cycle of life and death. And most good um, beef operations I'm aware of use very um, very humane methods of, of allowing the cows to have their last day of life, you know, killing the cows where they put them in a space where the cows are not stressed. And then they use a bolt gun, which is an instant way to kill the animal. And that's been shown to have like very little stress on the animal. Mm -hmm. So I think you, uh, of course, I'm not a fan of CAFOs. So clustered animal feeding operations, you know, like factory farming agriculture, putting animals, whether it's cows or chickens or pigs in stressful situations, not good. They're going to release stress hormones, but they don't have the same defense chemicals in their, in their muscles or in their organs because these animals can run away from you. Because when I talk about defense chemicals, I often say plants don't want to be eaten and people will say, well, animals don't want to be eaten either. And mm -hmm. I say, well, animals have a different way to, to they locate. run. They mm. run. They mm -hmm. locomote. You know, I haven't seen many plants run away. So they have yeah. had to evolve these things out of necessity. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to talk more about alcohol, tea, cola, coffee. We'll get to those in a bit. But right now, let's tune into a question from Instagram. Mimi wants to know, what are the four healthiest foods to add to your diet? So really what we're talking about here, healthy, most nutrient dense. I added the word four here again, because I heard your podcast about here are the four things that I would add into a human diet. But even if you just subtract the things that we talked about a moment ago, the seed oils, the high fructose corn syrup, the artificial sweeteners, and for many people who aren't thriving, veggies, or, and I would say that some veggies are probably more problematic than others, the ones that are high in oxalates, et cetera. But now what do we to address Mimi's question head on, what do we add into the diet? What what can I eat now? Because I go to the grocery store and you said I can't eat any of, I walk around, it's like, there's seed oils in that and that and that, there's high fructose corn syrup in that. And I realize when I go to your average grocery store, I go to Sprouts or Ralph's or, most of the food in there isn't food. Mm. Yeah, so this is a good way to think about it. What actually is food? What things don't have labels? Um, what things don't need labels. Uh, you, and I think thinking about it from the perspective of nutrients is a good framework because it makes it simpler for people. Mm. Most of us weren't taught in elementary school or even secondary school or perhaps even professional school about different micronutrients. And it, again, I understand it's a dizzying array of things. Calcium, magnesium, manganese, selenium, K2, riboflavin, folate. Who knows what all these things are needed for in the human body? But it's been a fun thing for me to kind of think about the nutrients that we're aware of, because there are many nutrients that we're not even aware of in foods that can be beneficial for humans. But of the ones we know, if I know I need this many things, how do I reverse engineer that? How do I, and this is a minimalist perspective, I think, because I like the simplicity. How did humans get the most nutrient-rich food? I mean, we've been alive, we've, humans have been homo sapiens technically for 350, 450,000 years. Before mm. that, we were homo erectus, homo habilis, australopithecines. I mean, our, our, our genetic lineage as hominids has been going along a long time. And 
we didn't have Erewhon or Sprouts. I didn't say, <laughs> like, it can't be that hard. How did they survive without Erewhon? <laughs> <laughs> like, it cannot be that hard to, to get the nutrients that humans need to mm. be relatively healthy and functional and reproductively fertile. And so when you look at the nutrients humans need and you think, where are those concentrated in the highest amounts? The answer is unequivocally animal foods. And by mm. animal foods, I mean meat and organs. And most of us did not grow up eating organs. Mm. So things like liver, heart, bone marrow, we can get into the more exotic organs, spleen, mm. pancreas, kidney, testicle, ovaries, brain, but mm. those are those are pretty, pretty fringe for most people. But some of us grew up in ethnic places um, or you know, other places in the world, perhaps Eastern parts of the world where those things were included in dishes. But most of us didn't grow up eating organs. I never grew up eating organs as a kid other than liverwurst. Mm. Uh, that was the closest thing I got. And so we, if we start with the organs, which I think are the single most nutrient rich foods on the planet, I would start with a couple of organs. So the, the, the organs that I think humans could include in their diet that will really change the quality of their life by just giving you, it's almost like a video game analogy. Like you just get a life force boost. Mm. You just, you're not getting these nutrients other places very easily. Liver is the first one. Mm. And liver is fascinating. A lot of people are not familiar with the taste. It's very, it's very, irony, perhaps yeah. very ferric yeah. um, in taste. And so there's different ways to prepare it. You can freeze it. You can, you can grill it. You can get it in a desiccated capsule if you want. But liver is a great source of nutrients that a lot of people don't get. The one that I think of all the time is I could ask people, where do you get your riboflavin? Mm. And most people are like, I don't even know what riboflavin is. <laughs> but the, the answer, as far as I can tell, is that you, if you are not eating heart and liver, you're probably not getting enough riboflavin. Why do I need riboflavin? Well, mm. it's part of a lot of important processes in the body, like energy production at the level of mitochondria, mm. functioning of enzymatic systems that affect hundreds of reactions, like MTHFR, which is an enzyme that some people have heard of involved in methylation. So the, the benefits of riboflavin go very deep, and most people are not getting enough if they're not eating liver and heart. There are not really any good sources of riboflavin in the plant kingdom. Mm. Liver and heart are pretty much it. And then you you can go down the list with liver. It's going to be a great source of copper to balance iron. It's going to be a good source of things like vitamin A, vitamin K2, choline, another thing that's critical for brain. And so it's just, it's this powerhouse. It's this really important organ to get. And then you have heart. Well, heart is another good source of riboflavin if people don't want to eat liver, but heart has coenzyme Q10 and the list goes on and on. And so- and the, Heart tastes much more like traditional oh, muscle man. meat. Yes, heart, is, heart is so good. It's like, good. Yeah, it's it's tasty, man. But like with liver, it's funny because I've never liked liver. I mean, I have had we did the, shooters. Yeah, exactly. So I had the I've had the best liver and onions, right? And it's really good. But like after a while, you're just chewing and chewing and chewing, and it get, gets really dry and irony. And you talked me into doing the raw liver, and that is how I eat liver now. Like I prefer to do it raw and do those liver shooters than than yeah, cook it up and eat it. Yeah. And so organs, I think, are the first thing, and then the meat, animal muscle meat is is similar. I mean, muscle is an organ, but we think about them colloquially as two different things. So meat and organs are the, are the first part of the, the equation. Let, let me ask you about one organ. Yeah. Uh, what about tongue, cow tongue? So it's, it's, it's a very tender organ when you cook it in a crock pot. It it's, has a, it's so good, It has man. a unique taste. Yeah. I'm not familiar with any unique benefits okay. of the tongue in terms of nutrients, but um, I've just never seen any literature on it. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious because I, I love me some lingua. It's, yeah, yeah, delicious. it's delicious. Yeah. But I will say this before we move on from organs real quickly. There's really interesting evidence that I have come across recently regarding the way that organs can specifically affect the organ, the corresponding organ in the human body. So... Mm some of the most interesting studies I've seen are giving brain extract, phosphatidylserine from the brain of cows to elderly people who have cognitive decline and it improves their cognitive function. And mm -hmm. this is wild, right? They've tried to do the same thing with plant-derived phosphatidylserine. It doesn't work because phosphatidylserine from animals is different than phosphatidylserine from plants. So you have brain extract from cows improving the cognitive function of humans. You see the same thing with thymus, which is an organ that very few of us remember, but it's, a, it's an immune organ that sits behind the sternum that regresses, it involutes as we age. But in both animal and human trials, when you give thymic extracts, the thymus begins to grow again. And in kids, in human kids, they get less respiratory tract infections when you give them an immune organ. It's really interesting stuff. Yeah, it's really wild to yeah. see how deep kind of the, the sort of, I don't know, the, the evolutionary parallels go with these organs. And now, then, yeah. Now, what do you say to people? Because you, you're talking right now about adding in a lot of animal products. And there are a lot of people out there who are vegans or vegetarians. And some of them are really thriving on that. We have a friend, Dr. Joanne Cacciatore, who's been a vegan. She runs a farm uh, for like 28 years. And yeah. you could tell she's just thriving. And so it may be that for some people, for whatever reason, she's able to 
digest and, and make bioavailable the nutrients that are in plants better than someone else who is struggling with a vegan diet? It's possible. It's possible. I think there are, I've seen, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who benefit from vegan diets, I think for a variety of reasons, perhaps it's cutting out the processed foods. Um, mm. And then I've seen a lot of people, sadly, really benefit for a few years and then get very bad. Yeah. Um, I've had a couple of people on my podcast who were vegans and depression, autoimmune issues. So I think there's something there that we don't fully understand. There are cases, um, I might characterize them as outliers mm -hmm. of people who are vegans and quote unquote thriving, but the majority of people that I've seen and worked with, and perhaps I have a confirmation bias, but I do come in contact with a lot of people don't do well without animal products for more than two or three years. Well, I think that makes sense because what you were talking about earlier, we've evolved over about three to four, maybe more than four million years since we climbed out of trees and started looking around and saying, what else is there to eat? Yeah. We've evolved eating animals. Now, just because something is natural doesn't mean that it is the most appropriate thing to do, right? I mean, we do things that are not natural. It's how I drove a car down here, right? My ancestors didn't <laughs> yeah. drive a car down here. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and so, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong to do that necessarily, right? It may be the most appropriate thing. It's way better than walking the 76 miles down here once a week. And so um, for some people, they thrive uh, on that diet. Just like I think of my wife, she has a very similar diet to yours, but she eats some vegetables and is thriving on that, right? And she's like just as fit as you as well. So like, I think part of it is like that she's exercising all the time, similar to you, and she's able to take in these calories and use them. But she also doesn't have the digestive issues that someone like me has. Like I've got an autoimmune condition that I can't barely eat anything, especially certain vegetables. Like if I eat a sweet potato, um, if I eat an entire sweet potato, it feels like my ankles are broken. Mm. And it's like, oh, wow. That's okay. probably oxalates. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. I think so. Um, but even white potatoes will do... The, oxalates so, in there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but, and, and so a lot of oxalate-rich foods will harm my digestion because mm. I have leaky gut or, or you know, the tight junctions in my mucosal exactly. layer are, are compromised. It, yeah. Isn't it possible too, though, like if you cut out every single oxalate in your diet right now, like isn't there, there could be an adverse effect by just cutting them all, all, all out together, right? Is that true? Yeah, so some people experience a, um, a dumping syndrome. Mm, <laughs> so, oxalate dumping. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing. And it's, yeah. it's, I think clinically, it's the body saying, okay, we're ready to get rid of these and all of them come out at once. Oh, yeah. so you get kidney stones. and Some people get kidney stones, some people get rashes. I mean, it's not, bad for everyone, but I have right. heard anecdotally of, it, of things happening. And so yeah. the recommendation for people, and we can't really know this because Western medicine has never explored this, yeah. is perhaps eat a little bit of oxalate. You know, don't eat 700 milligrams a day, but maybe 100 milligrams of oxalates per day, which allows a little bit of sweet potato mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe half a kiwi because yeah. kiwi actually has some oxalates in the mm. fruit. Or, you know, you can look at the high oxalate foods and you can still eat some foods that are moderate oxalates as you kind of do the transition. Yeah. When I found out chocolate was high in oxalates, I was I was so angry. Devastated. He was depressed yeah. for three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which just calls him to eat more chocolate. Yeah, so, so I can eat. I can eat anything, man. Like I am really lucky. I can digest anything. Like give me a bucket of nails, and it will hurt going down. But I could get them down and be fine. But the thing, make a perfect poop. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is like my. Um, I got skin issues. You talked about eczema and psoriasis. Yeah. I haven't been like diagnosed with it, but um, I know that uh, if I eat dates. If I eat even eggs, like I get this, uh, you know, anti or this uh, in inflammatory reaction on my face where like I get a little <laughs> beard dander if I get, you know, my scalp gets dry right. and stuff. It's crazy. Save that for the autoimmune question. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll double back on that. But I wanted to talk about the two other foods to add in here. You, you already talked about organs and animal protein from meat, dairy, eggs. But then there's certain carbohydrates that you're now okay with. Yeah, this has been the main transition from carnivore Paul that was here perhaps the last time. And yes. it's it's fun to do these journeys and to try to to face my own inner dogmatism and to mm -hmm. not really succumb to audience capture and these sorts of things. But mm -hmm. what I learned after about a year and a half, two years on a strict carnivore diet of just meat, organs, and fat was that long-term ketosis didn't work well for me. And now I've realized that it doesn't work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I added back in carbohydrates, fruit first honey and then fruit. And that helped with a lot of that stuff for a variety of reasons. I think that um, 
there are perhaps a few vitamins and minerals that are a little easier to get in fruit than they are in, in meat. But I think the majority of it is just that human physiology works well when we have carbohydrates. And mm -hmm. thinking about it from a, an anthropologic perspective, I, I really believe that the best characterization of this that I've, that I've come up with or seen is that fruit and carbohydrates, well, let's just say carbohydrates in humans are a signal of abundance. Historically, evolutionarily, if carbohydrates were available, it was usually spring and summer. If we're living by the equator, which is where we believe humans evolved, we had spring and summer most of the year. So we mm -hmm. had abundance. But as we moved away from the equator, carbohydrates become more and more a clear signal of abundance. And that connects with human fertility and human thriving. And mm. so the, the molecular mechanisms behind this are consistent in humans. When we eat carbohydrates, the, the body says, it kind of breathes a sigh of relief and goes, okay, now it's time to reproduce. Now it's time to get out in the sun and lift mm. rocks and hunt things and, and be to be a, a thriving human. When we don't have carbohydrates, we're in this metaphorical winter where we're kind of thinking, this is not the time to have babies. And this is maybe the time to kind of huddle together and to, to store our food and not necessarily um, do things that are large energy expenditures. So I think that for most humans, having carbohydrates in your diet year round, which is another year, nuance of the discussion, is a beneficial thing because we see improvements in hormones connected with this abundance. We see decreasing levels of something called sex hormone binding globulin, which allows more free hormones, specifically estrogen and testosterone in mm. women and men respectively. We see better electrolytes. We know that insulin signaling at the level of the kidney, insulin being this peptide hormone released when we eat protein or carbohydrates, but mostly carbohydrates. So it's released from the pancreas and it has many roles in the human body, most of which I believe are very beneficial. Insulin is critical for life, though it gets a bad rap. But at the level of the kidney, it gives this signal, hey, conserve sodium. Mm. And with the sodium, there's all these symporters and antiporters in the different tubules of the kidney come other minerals, come other electrolytes. So you things like calcium, things like potassium, things like chloride, things like magnesium that allow muscles to work well. So after a year and a half on a carnivore diet, I'm in the climbing gym and every time I tense my arm to hold a hold, I get a cramp in my forearm or I get a cramp in my uh, calf. And many people have experienced this um, on ketogenic diets. They just can't even stretch their legs in the morning because they'll get this lightning calf cramp. And that's an electrolyte abnormality that is really not able to be remedied, even with Herculean or massive amounts of salt. Some people are eating 20 plus grams of sodium chloride or oh, sea salt wow. on a keto diet in an effort to like manage their electrolytes. And it's just not, that to me is just, um, you know, like just really trying to put a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. You, you mentioned that uh, long-term ketosis doesn't really um, do good for you and for a lot of people. I know when some people on ketosis talk about carbs, they, they speak of carb cycling or only eating fruits during uh, periods of intermittent fasting. Do you have a schedule for when you do this or is it you'll have steak and bananas at the same time? I'll eat them at the same time. And so the arguments for separating your carbohydrates and your, your meat are generally around something called the Randall cycle, which is a bit technical. But what we know is that the, the human body likes to do either one fuel or another. It's like we have a gas hybrid car in the human body and it's only going to do gas or electric. That's the sort of, that's the canonical thinking, but we can do a little bit of mix of both. And so people will say that according to the Randall cycle, if you eat fat with carbohydrates, your body can't burn both and you're going to store the fat because it's going to preference the carbohydrates. Mm. But what we know at a deeper level is that if you're eating saturated fats with the carbohydrates, that doesn't seem to create this, um, this competition as much as polyunsaturated fats. So now we're back to polyunsaturated fats and seed oils being problematic. So polyunsaturated fats are probably the biggest issue with the Randall cycle in terms of competing things. So if you eat or if you're eating polyunsaturated fats with carbohydrates, that may affect this sort of um, this sort of tra railroad track uh, conundrum mm -hmm. that we run into. We can only burn one of these at a time and they're going to store the other one type of thing. But in in me and the people I've worked with, I don't see any issue eating carbohydrates with meat or fruit or like meat or fat or any of these things. I think it it results in no metabolic issues. It's something that we would have done evolutionarily. Like when yeah. I was with the Hadza in Tanzania, which I think is something I did since the last time I was here, um, you know, we're out hunting and we get an animal and the next thing they do, they're climbing a tree to get a, a beehive and they're handing me a piece of honeycomb as they're handing me a piece of liver right. that we cooked on an open wow. fire. So yeah. uh, it's, it's happening at the same time. There's never this like, oh, I need to eat this and then I need to eat this. I, I think that if you really look at the, the biochemistry to, at a granular level, there's not a real problem there for most people. Mm. So well, your I, banana I, yeah. and steak smoothies are totally okay. <laughs> totally okay. <laughs> it's, it's easy, so, right? It's so delicious. Put some liver in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I guess you have to pay a lot of attention to how you're preparing those saturated fats, right? Because going out to restaurants today and buying them a lot of them are cooked in some of the oils you're 
you're telling us. Yeah. So one of the most fun things that I do now with my content is this, I I call it like health journalism. And I put on the mic and my buddy's kind of filming me surreptitiously. Like he's being kind of subtle in the background. And we walk into restaurants and I go, well, I have a food allergy. Can you tell me what your food is cooked in? And it's interesting understanding what's happening there. And most restaurants are cooking in seed oils. They're Mm. using corn or canola or soybean or safflower. And most of them are doing it thinking that they're doing it correctly. I mean, Chick-fil-A uses peanut and on their website, they say peanut oil is healthy for humans. It's heart healthy. Again, it goes back to this thing that we talked about earlier. It may lower LDL, but then it raises the oxidized form, like the broken down sort of Mm. oxidized, really atherosclerotic form of LDL. Mm. But most of these businesses don't understand. And the consumer demand has been polyunsaturated oils because that's what we've been told is healthy for the last, really the last 50 to 70 years, but especially in the last 30 years. McDonald's used to use tallow in their fryers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until like 92 or something. Which is rendered beef fat and is very healthy for humans. It contains Mm. stearic acid, which is an 18 carbon saturated fat that is very beneficial for our mitochondria and and Mm. healthy for humans. Mm. And then we switch to peanut or I think they use sunflower or safflower now because the consumer demand, it was driven by this one, I forget his name, but there was this very rich uh, man who got heart disease and blamed it on the tallow Mm -hmm. (laughs) from McDonald's. I'm not sure how how he made the causal connection, but he he was, you know, he was in he was really instrumental in getting them to switch. Mm. And so now people think it's more beneficial. So a lot of restaurants are cooking in that stuff. How do you feel about other meats like chicken, pork? Um, Mm. So this gets a little nuanced. At the the highest level, I think if you're eating animal meat, it's going to be very nutritious for humans and Mm -hmm. it's going to result in better health. And it's going to get you a lot of the nutrients that you're not always going to get if you're eating exclusively plant foods. Mm. But if you take it a level deeper, you find that beef or ruminants, things like deer or elk or lamb, uh, it's they eat a diet that is ancestrally or evolutionarily consistent because they're fed on grass. Mm. But it's very hard to get a properly fed chicken. <laughs> right. Because almost no chickens in the United States are fed bugs and dirt, bugs and worms and leaves. They, they just, yeah. they have to be fed grains. Yeah. But chickens don't eat grains in the wild. So essentially mm. we have nearly 100% of all chickens, which make all the eggs and chicken meat that we're eating who are grain fed, like the equivalent yeah. of a grain fed cow versus a grass fed cow. Okay. And pork is the same way. Yeah. Wild uh, wild pigs will root and eat roots and bugs and worms or little, they'll eat little animals. I mean, they'll eat little like uh, mouse, mice and rats and things like that. Oh, so wow. that's like a, that's a real diet for a pig, but that's not what they're feeding them right. in feedlots. Yeah. Um, they're feeding them grains and they're mostly feeding them corn and soy. Uh, so what happens with monogastric animals and humans are a monogastric animal in um, distinction to a ruminant animal with multiple stomachs, we have one stomach. Mm-hmm monogastric animals cannot get rid of polyunsaturated fatty acids easily. So if you feed a chicken or you feed a pig corn and soy, they accumulate polyunsaturated fats in their cell membranes. Oh, wow. Which means their fat content increases in this polyunsaturated fat, this linoleic acid particularly that we find in seed oils that I think is harmful for humans at evolutionarily inconsistent levels. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a wild chicken or a wild pig, 4 to 5% linoleic acid in the fat. A domestically raised chicken or pig, 15 to 20% linoleic acid in their fat. Oh, wow. And just for comparison, canola oil, 20 to 25% linoleic acid, a soybean oil, 55% linoleic acid, grapeseed oil, 65% linoleic acid. That's why seed oils, I think, one of the reasons they're so harmful for humans. Mm. Tallow, 2% linoleic acid. Oh. Butter, 2% linoleic acid. Ghee, 2% linoleic acid. So I think people could run into problems eating lots of bacon, right? Yeah. You have a very fatty... No, not Cut. bacon too. Right? <laughs> but again, it's like first chocolate, now bacon. It's the, like chocolate covered bacon. Yeah, uh, right. They, they have bacon flavored chocolate bars. Yeah, they do, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure they sell them at Erewhon for $25. <laughs> right, uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, okay, There's so, even a bacon milkshake. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, what you do, like what you do occasionally is is not as big a deal as what you do consistently, mm. right? Like, So like bacon every once in a while, probably not a big deal. Sure. Um, chocolate every once in a while, probably not a big deal unless you have bad kidney stones or... Mm. Joshua's ankles, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Ox- Oxalate foods. <laughs> right. Tico's ankles. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, like making it the majority of your diet is probably not a great idea because yeah. of th- we're ultimately what we're thinking about is membrane health at the level of cells, mitochondria, the nuclear membranes, all these type of things with yeah. linoleic acid. Yeah. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I got sense. a little technical. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalist on uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Minimalist. We'll put links to Dr. Paul Saladino's 
handles in the show notes as well over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. Now, Paul, generally what we do here is we answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We call them minimal maxims. They're in the show notes so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media. But this time we're doing something a little special. We have several lightning round questions for you. So Ryan, TK, and I, we're just going to step back and let you do your thing. You'll have 60 seconds. And if you go over time, Professor Sean will give you the gong and Jordan will drag you out of the studio. <laughs> before, before we start, impromptu requests. Is there a way I can get in uh, three additional lightning round questions? Yeah, why not? Sure. All right. <laughs> Actually, well, let's save those for the talk about on the private podcast. Sounds good. Sounds good. There, there we go. Yeah. All right. First question here. Ruby. Why isn't the vegan diet optimal for human health? No fair. The time. Okay, I was going to say the timer starts. What are you reading the question? <laughs> Give me those three seconds back. <laughs> the vegan diet is not optimal for human health because it lacks so many of the nutrients that are found exclusively in animal foods. They generally start with the letter C, though that's just an easy way to remember them. Creatine, carnitine, choline. Then we get to the other C's, the non-C's, answering, taurine, vitamin K2, B12, it, riboflavin. It, it, you need these nutrients to thrive as a human. We've been eating animals throughout our history. I believe animals and eating them was one of the key events that allowed us to become human. We see this incredible increase in brain growth size about 2 million years ago when we started hunting more. It's a correlation, but it's quite compelling. So I think the vegan diet is not optimal for most humans because it is both deficient in the key nutrients that allow us to thrive and it allow, and it results in a large load of toxins like we talked about. So you're concentrating the toxins and you're getting the least nutrient-rich foods. But mm. if someone is thriving on that diet, you're not telling them they should change anything. I'm commanding you to do mm. anything. It's simply if you're struggling with mm. it. If you're struggling with it, consider the fact, become curious mm. and, and understand there are I, I, other ideas that, that um, there are other options that might result in health. Another question from Horace. If you could eat only the same meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Ooh, great question. <laughs> I actually thought about this last night as I was eating most of this meal. So I, my favorite steak is a sirloin flap steak. It's delicious if you guys haven't had it. I'm going to eat it with some frozen raw liver, a little bit of um, heart. Um, I mean, I guess this question's so easy because I can just have a colossal meal, right? I need to have a little bit of thymus in there too. <laughs> and then for um, carbohydrates, I'm going to eat some fruit or some fruit juice. I really like making fresh squeezed orange juice these days. Now, how is that ancestrally consistent? Orange juice. <laughs> You're in my 60 seconds. Say <laughs> 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 for the talk about yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do the rules work here? Yeah. <laughs> I make them. That's right. I guess so. We, we Let me finish and then I'll answer your question. Okay. Right. So we get orange juice and then uh, I'm going to have some dairy because I love it. I'm either going to have some raw milk, either cow or goat, and a little bit of honey and maple syrup. It's probably going to be my meal. Nice. Nice. Ooh, still under 60 still seconds. About, still about 15 seconds to respond to the interloper. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a LeBron move, by the way. You knocked away the ball, you blocked the first shot attempt, and he still drains the <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that we see that cultures make things like, the, we, we do process foods within cultures historically. Evolutionary cultures process things. They grind grains. They, mm -hmm. um, they, they, do, they milk animals. They will make juice out of things to remove the fibers. And so I think that... Um, People would say, oh, that's so many oranges. You're drinking five oranges. And I, yeah, it's delicious and I love it and I'm still <laughs> insulin sensitive. And so someone though who struggles with uh, fungal overgrowth in their intestines, they may struggle with something like they that. They may. It's the context we talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think the orange juice is causing that. Fix the root cause. And let's just add this for people as a little bit more of a of something to think about. Ask the question, what is causing this fungal overgrowth, mm -hmm. right? I, people want to believe or we there has been this idea this ethos that the fruit is causing candida and that's just not true that's mm. not the case it is dysbiosis probably coming from something else in your diet that is causing the candida to overgrow mm. candida candida whatever um, and so find the root cause correct that if you have SIBO and you have a motility issue figure out what is triggering that immune reaction against your neurologic system in your gut the fruit isn't causing it and the goal is to be able to help people improve the 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 basically the variety of their diet eventually. This is different than I used to think. And this is kind of a fun thing. Like, I'll say this, I want people to be able to eat as many foods as possible. And sometimes eliminating foods temporarily is very powerful. And then getting them back is a celebration. Another question from Lillian. Try What's to steal my time. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with tap water? And what kind of water do you drink? Now, before you answer that... <laughs> <laughs> Placed in front of Dr. Paul Saladino right now is uh, Mountain Valley, mm. flat water. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm out of I'm out, uh, yeah. Alabama. <laughs> oh, but um, tap water is a bit of a problem. 
60 seconds, go. So if you go to the Environmental Working Group, they have a really great database of the analysis of tap waters where you are. And you mm. can see what's in the tap waters. For most cities, Austin, Los Angeles, wherever, it's 70 to 200 contaminants on the order of pesticides, organic solvents used in industry, mm. uh, known carcinogens, uh, birth control, hormones, mm. other pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, and that's not, and that's not counting potentially problematic things with fluoride in drinking water, which is quite a controversial thing. Chlorine used in the water to uh, sterilize it and chlorine derivatives. So tap water is a nightmare. Um, be intentional with your water. You can also go to most of the water companies. Mountain Valley is a great one. I don't have any affiliation. I don't know if you guys do. Mm, um, no, no. They have on their <laughs> website, they have on their website a an actual download of the certificate of analysis and there's nothing really bad in Mountain Valley. So that's great. But test the water that you're drinking. Know what the COA is. I usually drink Mountain Valley when I'm in the States. In Costa Rica, I drink uh, coconut water yeah. from coconuts. Mm. Oh, wow. That's great. And also reverse osmosis is an option. So we'll put a link to the ewg.org slash tap, I believe it is. I first learned about that from you. Oh, and cool. it, it terrified me enough to make sure that I have a reverse osmosis filter uh, in my kitchen because any drinking water I have at home, I don't want it to be contaminated. So I'll put a link to the reverse osmosis thing that I use as well. I just want to say, if you use that link, just uh -huh. be prepared to be freaked out a little bit because it's not a matter of how much of this is in your drinking or if this is in your drinking water, it's a matter of how much. So yeah. like no matter where you go, I remember we grew up in Hamilton County, or near Hamilton County in Ohio, and it had like the best drinking water in the whole country. Still crazy amount of contaminants in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's terrifying. Uranium sometimes is in yeah. the drinking water. Oh. Another question here. Can I make a comment about the reverse osmosis before you we go jump? for it? Um, mm -hmm. Some people, when I say that I use reverse osmosis, because you can get a countertop reverse osmosis. It's very easy. You don't have to put the whole thing under the sink and hire a plumber. You can get a countertop reverse osmosis on Amazon. And, and it's great. It seems to work really well. Some people say, what about the minerals? And I think two things. I think you can remineralize it pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And if you're eating a diet that's nutrient rich, you probably don't need to remineralize your water, um, depending on what you're drinking. But if you're worried about minerals in your RO, just remineralize it or just eat nutrient rich foods. Yeah. Question here from Valentina. Besides diet, what are three ancestral activities that would improve the average person's life? Okay, here we go. So I think that most of these for me are around circadian rhythms and sleep. And it's avoiding blue light at night, sleeping at a consistent schedule. One of the things I've noticed living at the equator is that the sun sets and rises about the same time every day. So I have a consistent bedtime and a consistent waking time. And if you're anywhere in the world, that's going to change very slowly throughout the world, like if you're far from the equator. So mm -hmm. I think a consistent bedtime, a consistent waking time, light in the eyes first thing in the morning, and then avoidance of artificial light at night. Those are really critical things for me, along with grounding perhaps, which I think is very underrated mm -hmm. and very hard to do in a lot of cities. Being in Los Angeles, it's been a real challenge to ground. I can't just walk around in bare feet mm -hmm. um, in Erewhon and I won't get grounded if I'm there anyway. So I have to find a patch of grass, sit there in bare feet. And there's a surprising amount of good evidence with grounding. So grounding plus really controlling your sleep cycles similar bedtime, similar waking, and light in the eyes in the morning really helps set the circadian rhythm. Dude, you would totally fit into air one with with bare feet. Man. But there's no grounding mat. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true, but you would not be out of place. You're seated on a grounding <laughs> I, mat right now. So I saw, I'm so, I tripped over the wires. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually our explosive booby trap. <laughs> You can check out our grounding episode we did with uh, Clint Ober. Uh, amazing episode. People absolutely love that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Jeffrey has a question for us. What are the three most common environmental toxins in our lives today? This is a tough one in 60 seconds. I think I'm going to start with xenoestrogens, things like phthalates, parabens, um, it's in plastics and they're everywhere. Oh, so yeah. you um, you go to Starbucks and you get a coffee, which I'm not a fan of, and I think we're going to talk about that. Mm. And that coffee, that plastic coffee cup is lined with plastic. That, that paper coffee cup is lined with plastic. Mm. And that coffee plastic has PFAs, parafluoroalkylated substances in it. The butcher paper they use at Whole Foods, and I haven't figured out a, a great workaround for this. The butcher paper they use at Whole Foods for my meat has plastic on the inside, which could have xenoestrogens and PFAs. Every can you're using, even if it's BPA-free, has xenoestrogenic compounds in it because there's BPS and BPE. Every soda you're drinking, everything in a can, even things in a box, boxed water, boxed coconut, uh, water are lined with plastic. Wow. And that plastic contains compounds that are going to mimic estrogen or be endocrine disruptors in the human body. And that was just the first one. Give him a bonus minute, please. <laughs> <laughs> so then, we have, then you might have glyphosate, the pesticides, those are everywhere. And then mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, we could probably just stop there. Those are the big ones. I think if you're, if you're plastic and glyphosate, you're getting the big ones. But it, I think mm -hmm. that it's just, it just goes back to avoid 
Avoid plastics as much as you can. Don't drink water out of plastic. Think about the things your food is packaged in. And I can't avoid it. I'm not perfect in this. Most meat comes in packaged in plastic, but mm -hmm. if you minimize, then you'll be getting a lower dose of these things. Yeah. We have a couple questions from Tammy. What's her first question here? Can I still be healthy if I drink coffee? You better say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does my time start when I start talking? Or <laughs> oh, sorry, you're out of time, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could go into that further. <laughs> I think that, I think you can be, right? It's kind of like we talked about. A little bit of bacon, a little bit of yeah. chocolate, a little bit of coffee, not a big deal. I will say this. The quarter life of caffeine is 12 hours, which means that if you drink coffee at eight o'clock in the morning and you're drinking one cup, you're getting 200 milligrams of caffeine. Mm. And that 200 milligrams is going to equal 50 milligrams 12 hours later. That's what a quarter life means. So, oh, wow. Okay. So you have 50 milligrams of caffeine in your bloodstream at 8 p.m. That is going to affect your sleep cycles without a doubt. Now, if you're drinking two cups or some of the my compatriots are drinking coffee at 11 o'clock, <laughs> right? In the morning right now. So you're going to have a quarter of the caffeine in your current coffee 12 hours later. So I worry that as a society, we are chronically disrupting our sleep cycles mm. with coffee. That's probably the biggest problem that we have. And we're, that's just the beginning. What about energy drinks? What we're using at the gym at 2 p.m.? in the afternoon, right? Pre-workouts that we're using at the gym at 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. So it's just sleep cycles yeah. are getting, are really getting besieged today. It's so, it's so weird. Like you have people like Josh and my grandmother who are two uh, the same. I mean, I'm just kidding. No, but, <laughs> but they could drink coffee and go to sleep like that. I just, it's I wonder wild. if we put, if we put you in a sleep lab, would your sleep architecture be different when yes. you're doing that? Yeah, it would, it would actually be better with drinking coffee at night, but I think that's because <laughs> I'm so dependent on it. Uh, I'll tell you, I can drink coffee at 8 p.m. and go to bed at 8.30 and no problem. But if I don't drink coffee at night, my sleep score tr tracked with my aura <laughs> ring suffers. And I'm not, su I'm not suggesting to anyone they should go out and drink coffee. <laughs> right. What I'm saying is that I'm so dependent on it. There's something my body is telling me that, hey, you need this essential nutrient <laughs> <laughs> in order to sleep. Yeah. Anyway, we got one more question from Tammy here. What about olive oil and vinegar? So, um, vinegar, I don't really have any problems with. Know what's in your vinegar. Um, some vinegars are better than others and can have contaminants, but I think vinegar is great, although I think it can erode the tooth enamel if you drink too much of it because it's quite acidic. Mm. Olive oil is made from the fruit of olives, not the seeds. So in general, it's much better than a seed oil. But if you look at the uh -huh. amount of linoleic acid in olive oil, it's between 5 and 17%. So you're still getting a more olive oil than you would in animal fat. So I'm a fan of animal fats over olive oil. I would never cook with olive oil. I met a guy the other day in Arawan. He said, can I cook with olive oil? No, don't heat olive oil. It's mm. unstable. You don't want to heat the olive oil because you're going to oxidize the fats. If you want to heat an oil, use something like tallow or butter or ghee. Those are much better fats to heat in my strong belief. So mm. olive oil is okay if you want a liquid oil. And the only time I could think of someone using a liquid oil is if they're eating a salad. But you guys know how I feel about salads. So <laughs> olive oil, better than seed oils. Know the quality. A lot of oil is also cut with seed oils and mm. can have impurities. Uh, I'm going to go over on this one because it's a really important point. Um, if the olive oil is not cold-pressed, extra virgin, organic, you don't want it. Mm. What about coconut oil? Coconut oil is great. It's not an animal fat, but it's the it's my favorite plant fat. So it's okay. very low linoleic acid. And I think it has a lot of great qualities. It's good to cook with. But again, I would choose tallow, butter, or ghee because you're going to yeah. get vitamin K2, vitamin E, vitamin A, stearic acid, mm -hmm. um, like animal nutrients in the fat. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to save the sunscreen question for the private podcast coming up here in a moment. We'll get to all of TK's question. Alabama has some questions. The private podcast patrons. They are in the live stream right now. They got a bunch of questions. I think Danny is even over there jumping up with some <laughs> questions. So we have so many more questions for you. Dr. Saladino, you can check out his podcast. It's called the Fundamental Health Podcast. Uh, real quick uh, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. You know, we're talking about decluttering your food, but you know, you can also declutter your screens. So uh, Ryan and I, a few years ago, we came up with these seven minimalist wallpapers. Because whenever we do anything, it's steeped in irony. Mm -hmm. So we can't have a minimalist wallpaper. No. There's seven minimalist wallpapers for your phones, for your desktop. Collect all seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you technically have to. You download, you get one file. <laughs> we'll send you all seven for free. You can find them over on our resources page over at theminimalists.com slash resources. You can download all seven minimalist wallpapers. There's one, the five questions questions to ask before buying. That's my favorite because you put it on your, your phone screen and you're at the checkout line getting ready to make that impulse buy, maybe at Air One for the $47 smoothie. And you're like, oh, okay, here are the five questions I need to ask before I buy this thing. But it's especially helpful. You have it on your desktop and you're getting ready to buy, you're getting ready to impulse buy a reverse osmosis filter on Amazon. 
Here are the five questions to ask right here on my screen as a constant reminder. So if you want to simplify your smartphone screen or your desktop, head on over to theminimalists.com. Click on the resources tab there. You'll see a bunch of free resources, including our seven minimalist wallpapers for your smartphone and desktop. Alabama, I want to check in with that live stream. Do you have a comment for us right now? We sure do. We have a comment here from Nastasia. She says, I love all of Dr. Paul Saladino's mini reels about seed oils, what to eat and what to avoid, how to shop at grocery stores, etc. Super helpful. Yeah. You know what was so freeing for me, Paul, was when I started eating this way, because I ate relatively healthfully before. I say relatively, right? but it was causing a lot of issues, a lot of oxalates and the smoothies and all the stuff that I was eating was causing all this indigestion and, and, and just upset in my stomach. It was really freeing when I walk into a grocery store now and I look around, I realize like, Oh, I can't eat any of this. Mm. And that it eliminates all the sort of decision fatigue because I simply know none of this is for me, or at least 95% of it is not for me. And it gives me that freedom to move forward and actually get the things for my body that are nourishing, that make me feel healthy. I remember when we were living up, I remember when we were living in Montana, like Josh challenged himself to eat like a bag of spinach every single day. <laughs> I used to carry around pocket greens. <laughs> he really did. Pocket greens. <laughs> <laughs> full of warm vegetables everywhere he goes. Right. <laughs> he has like a big potato in his pocket. Patrons, we'll get back into your live stream in a moment. But first, Malabama, what do you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hey guys, my name is Jenny and I'm calling from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I wanted to share a tip and trick with minimalists that have a family. My husband and I recently became a family of three, welcomed our son Micah into the world six months ago. And adding another being to our lives can add a great deal of physical items and items that are outgrown really quickly. To honor our family's minimalism efforts and living within our one family income needs, we met um, and went to a family member who has a son one year older than our son, Micah. We asked them if we could borrow their baby clothes and toys that they were storing in their basement and bins just in case they had another baby boy. So we thought that we could use them now rather than them just collecting dust in their basement. We have saved a great deal of time and money by borrowing these items. And in turn, we're storing them in our basement as the family has a smaller home and doesn't have space and they didn't want to pay to rent a space. We have even started buying bigger clothes and gifting them to the family member as they will become ours in the future when our son grows into that size. So we're creating this baby boy clothes, moving wardrobe, and getting the most out of each item by sharing them with multiple families. This could work with family members or friends, coworkers of any listeners um, that need a tip. Uh, It's a win-win for everybody. All right, y'all, that is our minimal episode for today. We'll see you on Patreon for the full three-hour maximal edition of episode 384, which includes answers to a bunch more questions like, why did Paul finally let go of his carnivore dogma and become an omnivore again? (laughs) What are the roles of stress and trauma in the gut microbiome and in disease? Plus, we got a million more questions for Dr. Saladino and The Minimalists. Also this week, we've got our obsolete objects segment, three obsolete kitchen items. I think we maybe even talked about more than three there. We've got an outstanding added value segment for you as well, and much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, check out The Minimalist Private Podcast, patreon.com slash The Minimalist, or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. Big thanks to Dr. Paul Saladino for joining us today. You can check out his podcast. It is called Fundamental Health. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And uh, you can check him out at carnivoremd.com. Some free resources over there. We'll put a link to all of his social media in the show notes as well over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. And if you leave here today with just one message, please let it be this. Love people and use things. Because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. 
Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it 